This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermi Shea. We turn now to Lebanon, where some 500,000 people have been displaced by Israel's bombardment. The Lebanese health ministry reports at least 72 people were killed and nearly 400 wounded in Israeli attacks on Wednesday, bringing the death toll to over 620 in recent days. Earlier today, Israel rejected a proposed 21-day ceasefire that had been called for by the United States, France, Canada, Australia, Japan, Qatar, the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, Israel has called up two brigades to the Lebanese border in a sign that a ground invasion could be imminent. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for peace on Wednesday. Hell is breaking loose in Lebanon. An all-out war must be avoided at all costs. It would surely be an all-out catastrophe. The people of Lebanon, as well as the people of Israel and the people of the world, cannot afford Lebanon to become another Gaza. We go now to Beirut, where we're joined by Lada Bitar, editor-in-chief of The Public Source, a Beirut-based independent media organization. Lada, if you can talk about what's happening on the ground in Beirut, and here we are in New York, right next to the United Nations, you have this um, international call for a ceasefire, uh, but apparently the Netanyahu government of Israel is saying no, uh, the Israeli general in charge of the IDF forces rallying troops, saying he's preparing them for a ground invasion of Lebanon. Good morning. Here in Beirut, nobody really has uh, any hope in these processes in the United Nations, in the words of the Biden administration, um, or in uh, the words also of the Netanyahu government. Um, I wanted to share with you some things that will relate to me um, by one of our journalists who is now working in the South. He is going around to different schools that are hosting uh, people who have been displaced uh, from their homes but remain in uh, southern Lebanon. So first, he relayed to me that people are very, very tired. Uh, they're unable to sleep for longer than a few minutes at a time because of the relentless bombardment by Israel. Um, and he said that the shelters are full uh, with elderly people who have lived through so many massacres and witnessed so much horror inflicted by the Israeli settler colony. And he shared the story of uh, one woman in particular. He said that she was in her 80s. Uh, she was wearing her house key as a pendant. And she told him that uh, this is nothing in comparison to what they have lived through over the past few decades. And she mentioned the 1982 Isra uh, Israeli invasion of Beirut, the first Kana massacre in 1996, the second Kana massacre in 2006, and so on and so forth. And uh, the one thing that I want to relay here is that for a lot of these people who have been displaced from their homes, whose homes have been destroyed, uh, their attachment to their land only grows stronger. And this is a prevailing sentiment among those who have been displaced. And um, this is not uncommon for Lebanon. So if you will just allow me 30 seconds or so, I would like to read a brief passage that I came across yesterday. Um, written by Mehdi Amel, who was a Marxist intellectual. And he wrote this a few months after the 1982 invasion of Beirut. And uh, he writes, They said that the war in Lebanon would be swift, and that in a few days those who have not knelt and who understand only the language of force would kneel. They declared that there would be no salam but shalom, and that Israel is the Rome of our modern times. To the kings of Israel, to the scum of our nation and our foul Arab regimes, to the petty fascists and to their imperialist masters, we say, it pleases us to spit in your faces. We will fight you even with our nails. Our fists are the compass of history, and the bullet of our freedom will pierce your hearts. To them we say, brick by brick, we build a world on your graves. You are the dustbin of history, and Beirut is the city of the free. We have vowed that we will resist you. 
And this is not to say that everyone in Lebanon shares this sentiment. Um, and definitely not the over 200,000, up to half a million people who have been displaced from their homes over the past few weeks. Because there is a lot of suffering, there is a lot of hardship right now. People are struggling to find housing, shelter, food, diapers, milk. Um, hospitals are at capacity. Uh, people are really exhausted and uh, suffering across the board. Um, but for the most part, uh, this pain can be, can be pinpointed, the source of this pain can be pinpointed to the presence of the Israeli settler state in our region that continues to wreak havoc in Palestine, in Lebanon, and across most of the world. So, Lara Bitar, you uh, talked about this quotation that you read from uh, the 1982, when Israel invaded in 1982, and you've said that you don't have much faith in a ceasefire. So, if you could provide some context to uh, a possible uh, imminent invasion, Israeli invasion of Lebanon, talk about what happened in not just 1982, but also in 1978 and 2006. I think we have to take very, very seriously uh, every genocidal intent that is now being uttered by different government and military officials in Israel. Um, Lebanon has a long history of invasions and occupation and terror by uh, the Israeli state. And we can go even further back to 47, 48. Uh, Lebanon seized uh, over a dozen uh, Lebanese towns and villages. In 78, uh, there was also an invasion in 82. Uh, the 82 invasion lasted until the liberation in May 2000. There was also an attempted uh, ground operation in 2006. And in, in terms of the 2006, uh, attempted uh, ground invasion into Lebanon, uh, soldiers who returned home uh, recounted how traumatizing it was for them, how they felt that they were fighting uh, with ghosts. They could not see uh, the fighters on the other side. So I think it's important to note that coming into Lebanon is a deeply traumatizing and frightening experience for the Israeli soldiers who are accustomed uh, to throwing bombs from the safety of uh, the airspace. Uh, but on the ground battle, uh, on the ground conf confrontation with real fighters who are fighting for their land, for their country, for their people, uh, they don't stand much of a chance. Um, and uh, to the point of, of pushing for a ceasefire or for a truce or for the Biden administration having uh, any kind of red line. Uh, we saw exactly what happened in Gaza over the past 11 months. Uh, the Biden administration was repeatedly saying that uh, Rafah was a red line, that a ground invasion into Gaza was a red line. Uh, but the Israeli state, uh, uh, there, was, uh, there were absolutely no repercussions, uh, no ramifications for any of the actions that the Israeli state was doing. And this is what compelled it to continue to escalate, to continue to escalate its massacres, its terror of the Palestinian people in Gaza, who to this day um, continue to endure daily massacres that are not being reported on as much as they were at the beginning of the war. Lara Bitar, so if you could um, tell us a little bit more about how you think Hezbollah might respond to a, a, a possible invasion and also explain uh, resolution, UN Resolution 171701, because the UN Secretary General speaking Wednesday, he warned that Lebanon is at the brink calling for an urgent ceasefire, but he also called uh, for the implementation of UN Resolutions 1559 and 1701. I can't really predict how uh, Hezbollah will respond, but we, what we know is that so far 
Hezbollah has continuously tried to de-escalate. Hezbollah is not targeting civilians or civilian infrastructure. They have consistently aimed uh, their weapons at uh, military uh, infrastructure and sites and soldiers. Uh, even after the pager attack, the walkie-talkie attack, uh, repeated campaigns on Dahye just a few minutes ago before we before I joined you, Dahye was yet again bombarded uh, by the Israelis. I think this is the eighth attack uh, on the Lebanese capital. Despite all of this escalation from the Israeli side, Hezbollah remains restrained, uh, is con continues to try to de-escalate. And uh, the only ask here, which is not a really unreasonable ask, is uh, for Israel to immediately end its war on the Palestinian people of Gaza after 11 months. Uh, as far as UN resolutions, for the most part, they're not legally binding. For the most part, they're not respected. The 1701 resolution that was adopted after the 2006 war is habitually, if not daily, uh, violated by the Israelis uh, in a variety of different ways. Um, that's why the majority of the Lebanese population uh, is not holding its breath, waiting for a UN resolution or for the Security Council or even for the international community. Uh, I think not just the people in Lebanon, but people around the world had complete, have completely lost faith in the so-called international order, uh, the rule of law. Um, so right now, uh, we can only expect things to get significantly worse uh, so long as uh, the international community does not take any action to halt uh, the insanity and the barbarism of the Israeli state, so long as uh, the Western world continues to supply the Israelis with weapons, with support, with diplomatic cover, um, we have a very little chance of seeing uh, an end to these uh, to to this campaign anytime soon. But on the other hand, what people can do, people anywhere can boycott Israel, can put pressure on their institutions, on their universities, on the corporations in which they work in to divest from Israel. The only chance that we have is for the international, for, is for the world um, and for comrades around the world uh, to put this kind of pressure on their governments and on their institutions to isolate Israel. Uh, because uh, Israel will only stop this campaign and this war uh, around the region if it becomes too costly for it. And right now, it's not paying uh, any kind of price for its actions. As we wrap up, Lara Bittar, there is a protest that is approaching the United Nations now, especially people protesting what's happening in Gaza. You have Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, who delayed his trip by a day. He was supposed to address the U.N. General Assembly today. He's going to do it tomorrow. Uh, what do you expect? expect him to say. And in the U.S. media on television, they're saying that Blinken has been desperately, you know, rallying countries on the sidelines to get this 21-day ceasefire um, uh, that uh, the U.S., France, Canada, Australia, Japan, Qatar, the UAE and Saudi Arabia are now calling for. But you have The Guardian reporting um, that, in fact, um, an effort by France and Britain to secure a joint statement by the U.N. Security Council um, calling for a ceasefire is stalled in the face of U.S. objections. Your final thoughts, Lara. At the risk of repeating myself, uh, I don't see, uh, or we, for the most part, uh, don't really believe uh, anything that's coming out of uh, the Biden administration, uh, neither its uh, White House spokespeople or Blinken and others who are representing the U.S. And again, we have seen these maneuvers and this manipulation of public opinion, manipulation of the press, um, for 11 months. They are not serious about a ceasefire, neither in Gaza nor in Lebanon, regardless of what they're saying, regardless of what narrative they're trying to sell us. Uh, we're simply not buying it. Lara Bittar, want to thank you for being with us. Editor-in-chief of The Public Source, a Beirut-based independent media organization, speaking to us from Lebanon.